Buddy. Um, are we okay on audio? Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. All right. How's everybody doing? What's happening? Hey, I'm back on set tomorrow. Nice. Congratulations. Yeah. I hope you yeah. stay safe, socially distant. Oh yeah. Well, every you don't get on you don't get on set unless you have been tested like just well, I had to do like a spit in a tube test like yesterday. I find out my results like tonight, I guess. Um, dropping a link. I'm dropping a link to the current YouTube, uh, to the current broadcast. And dropping it uh, over on the schedule. I find that if I just do that, I know it takes like a, you know, a minute or something like right now. And then it's just there. And... Uh, otherwise, I just forget. It gets it gets trapped in all the other noise is what happens. All the rest of the noise in my life. Okay, that is now link link to the syllabus um, is complete, and link to the Discord uh, channel is complete. All righty, gentle friends, uh, let's do this thing. Okay, we're going to, um, hey, uh, a couple things I wanted to do. Um, I think that I mentioned uh, the other day, uh, I'm not going to share all the numbers today, but I'm, I have some numbers that are just still showing kind of a, a severe drop off. And again, I know that, you know, most of the time, you know, giving a little speech like that to, to you <laughs> who are here and or, you know, either you're here like right now while we're live or you're watching it on YouTube, you know, uh, paradoxically, ironically, you're, you're probably not the ones that I really need to be talking to. It's the ones that we haven't seen for a while. So anyway, just stay up, okay? Um, we're going to have module five. Zach, I didn't, I didn't, uh, I think as of yesterday, I don't think module five was liberated but we do need to get module five fully liberated. We'll have it liberated by the end of the day. You, we will have it liberated. Zach will personally see to it that we will have it liberated by end of day. Um, okay, let me see. Zach, is there anything else housekeeping uh, that we need to be dealing with? Not. I don't think so. But so one other just thing, here's what I want to do. Scary numbers. <laughs> Say it again, Zach. Just the scary numbers. Just the scary numbers, exactly. Now, uh, there is one thing I just want to say, which is um, I'm going to try to do a thing starting today. We are a little bit behind, like a little lot of bit. We do catch up. At the end, the, the, the modules down the stretch, literally some of those are like a day. And, you know, like just a day and we're done, you know. And uh, so it will catch up later on. Um, but we're still behinder than where I would like to be at this point. Um, okay. So uh, what I'm going to do starting today um, is I'm going to go like 15 minutes longer and then, and the reason that works is because everything streams to YouTube, right? So you can still, if you got to get to class, totally get it. Just pause it, you know what I mean? Jump back to YouTube, you know, and grab that last 15 minutes. But I want to just keep moving forward on the material just to, to, for those that are ready to move on so that we're not holding everybody back, okay? Um, I don't, I mean, logistically, that shouldn't be a problem, uh, but, but if there's anything I'm just not thinking about, then, you know, please let me know. Okay. Um, so what else? We are in, we're in von Neumann, right? We were starting to talk about, I think we got to this part. You're like, but the slides, the slides. All right, I got a hot mic on a keyboard. Just a heads up on that, whoever's... Sorry about that. 
all good. <laughs> That's, you know, we all do it. Uh, okay. Um, am I correct we got to hear? Did we get to hear? Does that seem right to everybody? Anybody, Bueller? I think that we were going to, we talked about, we talked about von Neumann. And then we did this kind of a basic picture. And then I think we were going to jump into essentially just walk through each of the chunks here. Yeah, that's where you were. Yeah, you wanted to go deeper. Yeah, it seems familiar. All right. Thank you very much. Um, All right. So we're going to just talk about, we'll talk about memory first. This is really the point at which, you know, we've been doing all the circuit crap, right? You know, doing all the, not crap, you know what I mean? But, you know, all the transistors and the low-level grungy and building these circuits and AND gates and OR gates and stuff like that. Actually, hold on real quick. Hold on. Sorry, I just realized that there was this rogue space heater that was on that side of my office and um, it was slowly going to cook me at a very low, you know, very low temperature over an extended period of time and turn me into human beef jerky, which I was not willing to put up with. Okay, so, um, oh yeah, von Neumann. Um, So... <clears throat> what we're going to do is basically, thank you, that's how I was starting to feel. So basically, we're just going to walk through, we've done all the little piddly stuff and, and kind of built memory and we built, you know, these different things. But this is where we just kind of talk about the general broad concept of computing, right? Which is a fairly old idea. Um, and we're going to walk through each one and introduce the ideas, Okay. Uh, memory. We built some memory out of circuits, right? Um, we talk about RAM, which is random access memory. And what that means, uh, think about, you know, what's sequential? Just uh, anybody? Um, well, we got it down here, really. You know, VCR tape versus a movie file. You know, I can just go on to whatever my player is and just drag it to wherever I want to be. Boom, I go, right? It's random access. I can jump in wherever I want. The the old VCR tape, if you guys are old enough to remember that, uh, you know, you had to rewind the tape, that special rewinder, so as not to burn out the motor in the VCR, right? You started cassette tapes, you know, all that kind of stuff. The sequential, that's right, be kind, rewind. Exactly, that's just advice from a bygone era. And, um, but when we began to have hard disks, you could, again, you know, kind of jump to anywhere, which was much more of that random idea. Um, And uh, now what's interesting about disk memory, I mentioned right here, I say right here that, you know, with disk memory, they have to be read sequentially. Now, this is the thing that I want to say about that, that's a little bit counterintuitive that you don't really think about. The disc is spinning, okay? It's just this little platter, and it's spinning, and there is, man, I should, I should think about my visuals before I get to this point in the operation. I'm going to go with this here letter opener, and this is my disc platter, right? And it's just spinning at a really, really high rate of speed. And then along comes, oh, this is beautiful. Okay, check it out. Back scratcher. Because, you know, you got to have it. Um, Actually, hold on. I can do better. I can do better. Paper plate. Okay. So here's this disc. It's going zing, zing, you know, just spinning really, really fast. And on the paper plate, on this uh, thing, there are... um, This is a rough approximation... Basically, there are sectors that are like pie slices, okay? And then, 
in these sectors, there are tracks. Sorry, in these, in these uh, uh, tr you know, pie slices, there are, um, you know, little, little uh, uh, what they call sectors. And this is essentially a, you know, a spot from here to here on the memory, literally that kind of a shape, okay? And, and these exist all over the place. So this is what we're talking about. And so when you go to read from disk, you're like, okay, but isn't it random access in the sense that I can kind of jump to anywhere on the disk? And the answer is ish, okay? I can jump to the start of a given sector, but here's how I do it. Don't forget the back scratch. This is such genius, pedagogical genius. I can't even control myself. This guy's spinning, right? So I'm gonna do it kind of like this way. This guy's spinning. I can't, it's mirror image, so I can't really do this smoothly. This guy's spinning, right? Now, here comes the read right head, and the read right head is got this little servo motor that's moving it to the different tracks. So it's like, jen, 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 jen. And whenever you, if you remember, I don't even know how many like real moving platter hard disks are even out there anymore. It's like so much is solid state, which is basically non volatile memory, non volatile RAM. But back here, this guy is going, you, you know, you'd like write to a disc and you could hear it going, right? You could hear this sound. That's the sound of this read write head on a little arm going, just moving back and forth. So he's like, I'm on this track, I'm on that track, I'm on that track, okay? While this guy is spinning, right? So in order to read this sector, it's got to like start by positioning this guy and then, this is so hard to do, I'm so sorry. But okay, you position the read right head and then all of a sudden it's like, ready, go. And now you start streaming what comes off of it and then you stop. And then this guy goes to maybe another sector where the next part of that file is. This is the most brilliant thing I've ever done. Uh, teaching wise. But does this make sense? So it's actually, it's, it's a bit, it's random access in the sense that I got to get this guy positioned, but then I got to wait. I do have to wait until the, the platter spins uh, until it comes under. And then I've got to read it sequentially as it comes off. Okay. That was, that was amazing. Now, I, I had some, some brie right here, which I'm going to put back on that plate. Um, so, in that respect, okay, yeah, vinyl record is a really good example. It's also, it's a very similar example, right? If I want to play the song, I can, you know, I can put it, but I can, actually, the vinyl record works very much like a, like a classic hard driver. The thing is spinning. It's spiral, though, instead of individual tracks, right? On a, on a hard disk, on my hard disk here, the tracks are like just concentric circles, whereas on a vinyl, uh, which are now making a comeback inexplicably, um, that's right, just like the spirals there on, what is that, is that Pikachu? Um, the spirals, it spirals down to the bottom, at which point it just has one circle at the very bottom where it just, you know, spins. Um, so it's sequential in the sense that I can pick the, the needle up uh, okay, not a Pikachu. I don't know my Pokemon very well, but I can pick the needle up and I can move it to a certain spot, but I still have to like wait until, you know, the, the vinyl record passes underneath. In contrast with read with, uh, with memory, remember the memory we wrote, you know, right? We, we built, we didn't write it. We looked at it, but remember that memory, um, with the, th you know, three bit bytes and there were four of them. We could select any one of those memory spots, same thing if there was a, you know, a billion or a gazillion memory spots. We just simply put the right values on those lines. The CPU does this. Put the right values on the lines. Boom, right? In the same number of cycles every time, that, that piece of memory is, is activated, you know, like alive. Now I can just, you know, I can, and it just drops out in parallel. So that's random access. Okay. <clears throat> um, so, when we talk about main memory, we're, we're pretty much talking about RAM. 
Okay, it's random access. I can get there. Um, what else to say about that? That's probably good. Here's another example to try to illustrate the idea. Um, you know, you go to a you go to a little post office, right? And at the post office, you've got these boxes. The boxes have numbers, yeah, and they're linear. I guess this goes right oh seven two twelve, two thirteen, etc. These are in sequential order. Well. You, you have to differentiate between the contents at that memory location and the address of that memory location. In this case, you know, 221 is the address of that box, contents or whatever's inside. Same thing here, these are the addresses, which happen to be starting at zero, you know. And so this would be, now this is something that'll also show up like on the exam for module four. We already talked a little bit about memory, but, but just to kind of be clear about this, this is address zero, address one, address two. What's the first address? That one. Zero is the first address. That's the, you know, and zero, zero, one is the second address. But we don't, we don't refer to addresses by, you know, first, second, third, typically. We just refer to them as you know, address seven, which would be this spot right here at the bottom. That's address seven or number seven. Um, and then the contents are going to be just like in our little memory example that we built, um, just a set of zeros and ones that are just living there. Um, okay, hang on a second. Um, okay, and uh, as always, stop me if you got any questions, otherwise I'm just going to keep going, okay? Now, here comes, here comes some stuff that's, that's pretty important. These three terms are kind of important. You, you probably already have figured out by now that I'm not a massive fan of a ton of rote memorization. Like, you know what I mean, uh, memorize all these terms. But there are concepts you need to learn. And But this is one where the terms have some value that I want to make sure that you, you know, hold on to. One is that, you know, the notion of an address, the notion of an address space, and the notion of addressability. They're a little dicey because they all say address, right? So the address is just basically a number. But it's, and it's an unsigned integer. It has to be, right? There's no concept of a negative address. You've never seen, uh, you know, negative 120, you know, Main Street. Um, they will sometimes do, you know, change the numbers going, you know, small to large going north and then from the same spot, small to large going south, which is kind of like negative numbers, you know. But really, it's just like, all these positive numbered addresses, and then you turn around 180 degrees, and all those, you know, uh, positive addresses, okay? But there's no, there's no concept of a negative memory address. Like, what's that address? Negative 7. Well, there is no negative 7. It goes from 0 to the end. So um, that is the address, and that becomes really important. Um, Remember our little, our little memory thing that we built? The address was the two bits that, that selected which of those four bytes we were going to either write to or read from. Um, the address space is the number of, of uniquely identifiable locations. And that's just another way of saying... <clears throat> in, in other words, another way of saying that is that if I have an address with like eight bits, right? And, you know, the number of the number of total possible addresses would be 2 to the 8th, right? From 0 at the very beginning all the way to 2 to the 8th minus 1, right? At the at the end. Um, that's called the address space, okay? Um, that's anyway that that's just just a term okay and then this is the other thing that's kind of really just important to remember it's we remember when we were talking about numbers and talking about binary numbers and, and talking about like if you have n bits you know how many different values are there well there's two to the n that's how many different values are there what is the range of those values 
Well, from zero, these are unsigned, from zero up to two to the n minus one. So that's our range of things. Well, that's the same with addresses. That Those are the addresses too. You give me an n bit address and I can get you from zero to all the way up to two to the n minus one. Okay. Um, quick, quick question. Yeah, so, please. Uh, initially, I was kind of confused, but I thought I'd double check. It seemed like, oh, you need as many address bits as you do bits in the rest of your memory. So half of your memory is always going to be addressing. Um, mm. Am I correct in thinking that you really only need like two to the n bits addresses, but then each of those addresses could have multiple bits at that address. Mm -hmm. So you yeah, can have that's like... Exactly, that's exactly right, Chris. Okay. Um, in other words, I have an address and the address has a certain number of bits in it. You know, and it, and it totally depends on the architecture of the system. You know, right. it could be eight bits, it could be 16, usually a power of two, um, but even then it doesn't have to. But right, so if I've got 16 bits in my address, then I'm typically going to have uh, 2 to the 16th um, locations, okay. mailboxes, right? But each of those mailboxes could have like 8 bits. Exactly. Well, each of those mailboxes would almost certainly have at least 8 bits. They could have 16. Sure. Could be 32. Sure. You know? it, it, but it could be some number. It doesn't have to be the same number as the address. But yeah. No, that's right. That's exactly okay. right. And well, where that becomes really critical is it's one thing to talk about, like, if you say, oh, yeah, I've got like a gig of RAM. Okay, a gigabyte of RAM. Well, um, cool. But that's the total number of bytes. But if you have like four bytes at every location then you don't have a gig of addresses. You have a fourth of a gig of addresses because at every address, there's four things. Make sense? Four bytes specifically, the things being bytes. So, uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. And that relates to addressability. Well, that is, so addressability has to do with when you give me an address, how much stuff is that is at each address? Okay. Um, you know, what's the data size at each location? If I say it's byte addressable, that means that at every memory location, there is a single byte. That is only going to happen in small systems, embedded, you know, certain embedded systems with small processors. And, you know, there's still a lot of that. There's still a lot of control systems you know, traffic lights and you know what I mean? You don't need, you don't need Windows, you know, 10 to run a traffic light. You don't need, you know, whatever the hottest new chip on the market is to run a traffic light. You need old x86, you know, processors or something. I have a question Cheap. for you, Dr. K. Yeah. Uh, this may be a dumb question, but why is it called word addressable instead of multiple byte addressable? I don't know. I, it's, uh, it's not a dumb question at all. Um... I think the answer is dumber than the question at any at any level. You know? Oh, really? You know, I don't okay. know, right? I don't know. Somewhere along the line, and I don't even know the history of it, and I don't know if I ever did know the history of it. Like, you know, somebody just decided that a collection of bytes that's in memory, we'll just call that a word. Mm -hmm. you know? Maybe it makes it... I mean, because for me, if I thought of multiple bytes addressability that would be more cognitively relieving to me yeah. compared to word addressable you know i know that's a it's but a perfect, we have to bear with it it's okay yeah no it's a yeah. perfectly valid point and i even i totally agree with it um and i'm only inflicting this term on you be just because that is a term of you know it's a term that shows up you know what i mean it's in the industry it's right. it's kind of like yeah. what you call that you know but i okay. agree completely you know and I think the reason that it's important is, is we, we often invent um, vocabulary because to talk about it requires a lot of syllables, you know? And also you don't then have a concise way to refer to 
well, what's the addressability in this thing? Or, you know, in other words, what's the word size? You know, okay. as opposed to saying, what is the multi-byte, you know what I mean? You, you start to like clog up a little bit as opposed yeah. to... Getting tongue twisters compared to regular... Right, yeah, so and when I talk about words, I can say, you know, it's four-byte words instead of saying it's four-byte multi-bytes. Oh, you yikes. know what I mean? And it yeah. just gets clunky. So somewhere along the line, if, if somebody wants to like look this up and drop it in the chat, that would be just fantastic, you know. I would be, be much obliged. All right, you know, cool, like thanks. What the history of word is. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a great question. Um, yeah, but so what is common in, in computers with any power at all is multiple bytes at each location, right? Word addressable. Um, okay, now, um, we're going to come back to this and you're going to get sick of it, but you'll also become fluent with it, which is there is in memory something, and the term is going to be uh, potentially different depending upon like which architecture you're going to, right? If you're on a Raspberry Pi or you're on a, you know, whatever, whatever kind of chip. Um, Raspberry Pi is, is more of a package. It's an ARM processor. But whatever processor you're working on, um, there is some kind of memory address register. A register is just a small chunk of memory, a little customized piece of memory that we built into our hardware. Okay? That's all a register is. So the memory address register is just this little piece of memory where we put an address. All right, it's an unsigned integer. Um, it, it's, it's exactly that little sample memory thingy that we did. Again, I keep referencing back to that. Um, and we're gonna, we're gonna actually, in the very next slide, we'll kind of show you, you know, where that, you know, just to remind you where that fits in, okay? <clears throat> um, so, uh, yeah, it's an unsigned integer. It's the address that we're writing to or reading from. It's just a sequential number starting at zero. The next address is one. The next address is two. And it's also a bit pattern, right? And I'm just going to do this real quick. Remember this guy. You love this guy a lot. And we had these two, you don't have to remember everything here, but just remember that, that like that was a byte. This, this top uh, horizontal line, kind of the row is a, is a byte. And this right here, this, this little, you know, an address with, with these two bits in it, that's just a selector for these, you know, for this decoder. So it's gonna select like zero, zero turns on the first bit, oh, sorry, byte. You know, zero, 01 turns on the next byte. Zero, 010 zero turns on the next byte. Well, now just do that like a billion times. Okay? That's seriously the drill. Okay? Now, and you're like, whoa, crap. How does that even work, right? How do you get to a billion? Um, did I talk about Ks and gigs and megs? Did we talk about that already? I think we did. Feels like we did. So I'm just trying to remember if I need to go back over if I need or if we can just use that as a point of reference. I think I'm going to use it as a point of reference. So let's just say, for the sake of argument, that I have four bytes at every memory location. And I'm going to go just back here again. I've got four bytes at every memory location and I've got four gig of memory. So I have approximately four billion addresses, right? Cool, cool. Now the question is, how many, how big, how many bits does my MAR need to be to access a billion, a billion, right? Memory locations. A terabyte? No, a gigabyte. No, we have a gig of addresses. My question is how many bits in the memory address register will enable us to address, to generate a billion, you know, unique numbers, to count from zero to a billion. How many bits do you need to count from zero to a billion? 
because that's what the MAR does, right? That's the memory address register. I put, I put zero in there and I'm talking about location zero in memory. Put a one, location one. Put a billion, the, the value, a billion. It's location one billion. How many bits do I need to, to represent a billion different values? Uh, would it be 2 to the 30th or other? Well done, young man. Okay, so here's the deal. So remember that 2 to the 10th is a K, right? Technically, it's 1,024. I mean, technically, precisely, that's its value, but it's about 1,000, right? And then remember what a meg was? Two to the 20th? Boom. And then a gig? Is 30. So you need 30 bits. That's right. So I would need 30 bits. And I might as well round up. If I had 32 bits, it would be... Two, if I had 32 bits, I could get 4 gig. Okay, now that's addresses. That's addresses. If this is the memory address register, the MAR, these are the number of addresses, okay? Isn't that kind of crazy? Two to the 30, so 32, that's, that's four bytes. You, you let me take four bytes and make an address of it, and I can access a billion different memory locations. So four billion technically. The MAR is only ever going to hold one address at a time. It That's changes right. to be a different address when you when you want to access memory. Yep. Okay. Yep. And then you think about the speed. And this is where you get into like, you know, billions of operations per second. You're like, whoa, you're gonna you're gonna like read a massive file? And you're going to go out and you're like every single time you put that whole number into MAR, go out to memory, do all the things we did. All that stuff's happening. And then like here comes the data flowing out of it. Go over here, put it somewhere, you know, and then grab the next address, go do it again. And then do that times, you know, the size of, you know, a, a data file containing Lord of the Rings director's cut, you know. I'm trying to think of a big file, a really, really big file, right? And the answer is, yep, yep, it's doing all that. And it's doing it crazy fast, like absurdly fast. So fast, we can't even really comprehend. You can't even comprehend, you know, a, a, a million. You can't even comprehend, uh, comprehend really, a, you know, a thousand things a second. But a billion things a second, it's crazy. It's crazy. Millions and billions. Suddenly, I'm Carl Sagan. Okay, so the M, but the MAR has to have enough bits to get to all the addresses in you know locations in memory. Okay, this these kinds of questions show up on homework and exams. Okay, and that's the one we just talked about. <clears throat> then there's a memory data register, and the memory data register either holds the value that we're going to put into memory or the value that came out of memory. It's the same register. Okay, and it's just, you know, hanging on to that information. And then I'm just going to, again, remember this picture again. Remember that thing we walked through? That's the MDR. We've represented it up here at the top and then down here at the bottom, but it's the same register, okay? It's coming in. It's just you put the data in there, then you do all that write stuff and the write enable and blah, blah, blah. Or when it dumps back out and it empties out into this guy here, yeah, same thing. And you're like, wait, 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 how can they be the same? Well, because this value is literally like, it's like literally that one. And then it just, you know, you could view that line. It's like, you know, when you look at a globe, for those of you that are not, you know, card carrying members of the Flat Earth Society, if you look at the globe, right, and you try to see a picture of the globe, they like unwrap the globe. And then there's a part where depending upon what you center the globe on, out on the fringes, 
they usually try to have the fringes be in the ocean, right? But you realize that that's the same as this, and they kind of wrap around. Similar idea, okay? Like, in other words, this wire right here would actually go rappy, rappy, rappy down, you know, into that right there. It would, it would tie together. Okay. Where was I? Oh, yeah. Um, we already talked about this. The meaning of data in memory is contextual, right? Because you're still re probably wrestling with this whole, like, what does stuff mean, you know? And it means whatever you want it to mean. The other thing that's a little funky, and it was kind of a, uh, a bit of an innovation back in the 30s and 40s, 1930s and 1940s, uh, where code and data are both in memory. Back in the day, you would do a certain amount of programming by like moving patch cables, you know what I mean? To create the, the, the basically to create circuitry, okay? And this was quite innovative, you know, and this was one of the big, it, it opened up, you know, one of the big contributions of the von Neumann architecture, which was the fetch decode execute cycle where you would just like, fetch an instruction from memory. If the general purpose computer fetch an instruction from memory, decode it, do certain things which we'll talk about, and then run it, okay? Fetch, decode, execute. And then uh, increment the program counter to the next location in memory where your program is, grab that one, decode it, execute it. But the code in the memory, you know, sorry, the code is just in memory, just like the data. It doesn't, in looking at it, you have no idea. Just look at a bunch of bytes in memory. You have absolutely no idea just staring at, that, at those bits, like what that is. No way to know. You can try to figure some stuff out. I mean, there are ways to try to, you know, divine what that is. But just, just looking at it, you don't know. The MDR, so remember that the MAR has to have enough bits so that you can represent all the memory that's out there because the number of memory locations possible is 2 to the n, where n is the number of bits in the MDR, uh, in the MAR. And again, that's different from architecture to architecture, but that's the relationship. In the case of the MDR, it's just got to be the same size as what's at every location. If you're word addressable, it's the size of a word, right? Um, put it another way. Imagine that you've got this uh, warehouse, right? And every location in the warehouse, that's memory, of course. That's my metaphor, is like the same size, you know? Well, and I've got this little receiving bin that stuff that comes out of the warehouse goes to this receiving bin. Guess how big the receiving bin has to be? Drum roll, please. It has to be the same size as the storage bins on the inside. Duh. If it's too small, stuff comes and it doesn't fit. If it's too big, it's just wasteful. And then when you're putting stuff into the warehouse, right, through the same mechanism, which is the MDR, whatever that thing is, you know, you got 12 eggs coming in. There have to be 12 eggs in your carton. Then those 12 eggs have to go to a, another... Um, carton somewhere in storage that can hold 12 eggs, you know, so everything with the memory, so, with the data, whatever the size of a word in memory is, that is the size of the MDR. Has okay. to be. Yeah. So there's no way that you could with a computer, like using the eggs metaphor, let's say you've got a container for 12 eggs in storage and you've currently got 12 eggs. There's no way that you could take them like two eggs at a time to store them in that storage bin um you could so the answer is you could depending okay because remember it's kind of social contract but in terms of the hardware okay we could but we don't well it depends on what the question really means is part of my problem because okay. if you're saying can a programmer just put a little bit of stuff in the memory and then a little more into that same spot and a little more? And the answer is yeah. And, but the underlying hardware mechanism says okay. 
whatever you go, whatever's going in there, you put right here in the MDR. Okay. You know, if it's a single bite, you put all your bits, and then it grabs that and it puts it into the location of memory. Do you feel that? Okay. Do you feel that yeah. inertial put? Yeah, that makes sense. I was asking about it from like a hardware perspective. That's right. Yeah, from a hardware perspective, um, and again, from a hardware perspective, yes, you could do anything you feel like. And no, uh, nobody would do that. <laughs> nobody in their right mind would do that. Okay. Or it hasn't been done, or I don't even know. But it's so contextual, Chris, right? It's so like, can I imagine a scenario in which it would make some sense to do something like that? Absolutely. But that's certainly not the common case with, you know, a normal computing system. Okay? So the MAR, MDR, these become really important in this von Neumann phase of the operation, okay? As we try to understand and, and you know, learn about the hardware. All right, and there's that MDR, which we already showed you. Okay, that's memory, all right? I'm going. If you don't stop me, I'm going, and I'm not offended if you stop me. I have a question. Yes. Uh, so do the MAR and the MDR look the same? Um. Uh, yes and yes and no. So they both look the same in the sense that they are both just memory and they're little dedicated registers and a register is just a little circuitry of memory, right? Just like that guy right there, you know, that could be four little registers. You know what I mean? Okay. But they don't have to be the same size. Now, it turns out when we get to it in the LC3, they are the same size. That's coincidence. They don't have to be the same size, right? Because the memory address register is tied to the memory size, right? The address space. And the MDR is tied to the addressability. In other words, the word size. Okay, but they're both registers, so they're basically structured the same. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, exactly right. They might not be the same size and they're going to be tied in differently, you know, but mm. yeah, absolutely. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. All right. CPU, the central processing unit. This is one of those funny terms, right? And, and one of the things I want to just say here, this, this is probably for some of you that have been around, you know, computers for a long time, this maybe just feels a little bit remedial. Um, you know, and I, I want to just remind everybody that, that, there are some students, and not, not a small percentage either, there are some students that, like, this is kind of their first real, you know, they had, they had uh, uh, 1,400, you know what I mean? They did some Python programming, and this is the first time that they've, you know, really had their hands down at this level on anything, right? There is a certain cross-section that are like that. So you hear terms tossed around like RAM and gig, how many gig of RAM, you know? No, exactly, Mike. This is exactly what I'm saying, right? To not criticize anyone trying to learn. And just to understand that, that sometimes, even though it's, you know, 2020 and there's a lot more tech everywhere, there are just people that just never thought they were going to be CS types until they thought, well, maybe I'll take 1,400, you know? And then they're like, oh, okay, I did okay. I liked it. Let me take 2,800, <laughs> 2,810, I mean, you know? Then they begin to, you know whatever, re regret that decision. But, you know, I'm just saying, you know, not everybody has had all this exposure to all these things. And so that's why there's a little bit of a remedial approach to some of the stuff. But CPU is one that's of those... Really good point. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, you know, and so CPU is one of those terms, right? Um, so I don't know what that meant, Jay, the not necessarily 2810. Uh, maybe some other classes that made them regret their life? I don't know. But here's the deal. CPU is one of those things where it's a term that gets thrown around, right? Some people, when you buy like a, a, a tower, you know what I mean? Like a desktop tower, you know, kind of a system, not a, a non-laptop, right? And you, you ever heard uh, like that main machine sitting on the side? They'll sometimes refer to that as a CPU, you know? That's a real... Anyone ever... Have you heard that? 1410, mm, that can be tough. Have you, um, have you heard that, you know, that, that big box, the box that, you know, that like yeah. goes on the floor, or, you know, referred to as the CPU. It's a, that's a gross mischaracterization, honestly. But what they're trying to say is that's 
all this stuff like here in the middle. That's all they're trying to say. It's not the keyboard. It's not the monitor. It's not peripheral devices that you plug in and whatever. That's what they're trying to say. A laptop, the keyboard, the, the monitor, it's all bundled together. You know what I mean? That's why they call it. But the CPU is actually a very specific set of circuitry inside that computer, okay? In the motherboard, in the main processor, right? So you will see, um, uh, yeah, and by the way, I think they call it, yeah, so Jones there said, uh, you know, it happens in the office and it bugs me. Yeah, me too a little bit, um, except for the fact that you do need a shorthand to, re to refer to that tower, that box, you know, but I don't even know what I call it because I always, I haven't had one of those for a long time. I'm just always get a really high powered laptop and live with that. Anyway, the CPU is, is specific circuitry built out of those, those same gates, built out of those same transistors. And uh, we're not going to break all the way into that. If, you, if you're digging that low-level crap, though, by this point, got to be thinking about computer engineering, um, you know what I mean, as a, as a pivot. Because if you really, really love that stuff, that might be where you're really, you know, destined to, to hang out and really enjoy things the most. If you're like, please, can we just program, then you're probably more software, you know. And you got to try to feel out you know, this, this class sometimes uh, I've found will, has induced computer engineering majors to switch to CS because they just love me. I don't know what the deal is. Or the reverse where CS majors are switching to, to computer engineering because they just, because they don't like me. No, because they, you know what I mean? They look at that and they're just like, this is really lighting me up a lot. And they, you know what I mean? And they decide to go more toward the hardware design and hardware implementation itself so it's like a personal preference is somebody goes one way and the other person goes the other way oh absolutely yeah and, and 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 by the way and i just want to say this as an interlude the notion that like somehow uh you know that it's harder easier well if you were truly macho you would go do the computer engineering because they have to have more math or something you know um that's just that's just not true um in in my opinion uh, it's a question of aptitude. And one of the interesting things, I've worked with a lot of hardware, really brilliant hardware people. And it's really funny. Um, you know, you're talking to, you know, a hardware designer at a big company, you know, doing really cutting edge stuff. And they're, you know, working on a processor that everybody in the world knows, whatever. And then I start talking about like data communications and protocols and, you know, high level stuff. And I'm talking about that's still kind of low level from a software perspective, drivers and stuff. And they're just like, whoa, whoa, whoa. And it all, their eyes fuzz over, you know, and they're just like, ah, uh, you know, and then if you start talking about languages and everything else that goes up, you know, and uh, all that other software issues and databases and, you know, compilers and all that other stuff, you know, they're just blown because they're, you know, in other words, everyone's got a world that they that they just frankly prefer, you know? And, you know, and there are people that, that really love the theoretical math. No, I don't. You know, I can do it. I just don't like it, right? And I, but I much, but I do like actually more of like the discrete math, you know, the kind of math. I found that, that when I was doing the calculus and stuff and physics and crap you have to do, yeah, I was glad I knew it. I was glad I was learning it. But then when I got to like discrete structures, the more of the discrete math, it was almost like, oh, native language, I'm here, you know, and that kind of suggested to me that I was really more destined to be on the computer science side of math than on the mathy side of math, right, or on the calculus side of math, whatever. And so you really just have to find what is it that gets you lit up about all that. You know, and then just go be true to that, you know, find, figure out what it is. You know, if you're beating your head against this class, you know, it doesn't mean that, that this is necessarily where you got to be sticking out. You know, you might be like, oh, you know what? I'm really more enjoying it when I get more into kind of information systems where I don't worry about any of that really low level stuff. And I'm dealing much more at an operational level. Right. Or information technology. There's different majors that still get you around technology. 
Um, and you got to find that. That's all I'm saying. And just the, I just want to, I just want to, you know, stop anybody, you know, from not, I'm not stopping you, but I'd like to just, you know, at least throw out my opinion that, that the notion that computer engineering is somehow more macho than computer science is just flat out untrue. Um, but it does relate to a preference for higher levels of abstraction, lower levels of abstraction, right? So, and everybody's got stuff that they, that they love. Find that. Find that thing that you really, really love. That's where I'm going with all that. Okay. That was a little interlude. Let's talk about the CPU, okay? The CPU has two chunks to it. Uh, one we call, we typically call the control unit. Um, I've seen that called different things, and I've seen it organized different ways. And the other one we call the ALU. That's pretty, that's pretty common vernacular, okay? What's not clear to me is whether you say this arithmetic logic unit or arithmetic logic unit. I prefer arithmetic because it feels more pretentious, and it makes. I me do too. Yeah. I've work. said it both ways as well. Yeah, arithmetic sounds like you're, I don't know, it just sounds really cool compared to... It does sound cool. It does sound yeah. like you're a bit of a pretentious ass. There's that risk. <laughs> now, if you're okay with being perceived... I agree. <laughs> if you're perceived <laughs> no, to me, arithmetic... Arithmetic, logic, I say. I, arithmetic. I need to be more I want aromatic. to go to my arithmetic class. <laughs> I say today I'm is just very kidding. arithmetic, is it not? <laughs> Yes, good for the lungs, Jeeves. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I say the photosynthesis is in fine shape today. <laughs> um, yeah, no, so, and I think for me, arithmetic logic unit just doesn't roll off the tongue. That's my problem. It doesn't feel right when I say it. So, therefore, I go arithmetic logic unit and mostly ALU. All right, enough of that. Um, but not enough of CPU. So, here's the idea. The CPU has control unit, ALU, and registers. Okay, now, now the control unit is running the whole thing. Remember at the end of state machines, and I showed you, maybe you don't, your eyes were already glazed over. I showed you a, the beginnings of a state machine that showed the fetch decode execute cycle, and then all the little steps that you do on each instruction. That's the control unit, okay? It is just circuitry. It's really amazing. Uh, it's very low level, but it's really amazing. It's just the circuitry that when the when the clock goes boom and the machinery just kind of lunges forward one crank, you know, clock goes tick, click, clock goes tick, click, you know, it just keeps going right one movement at a time. The control unit is being driven by all that and the control unit is driving everything else. All the circuitry flows from the control unit out to everything else which is pretty cool. The ALU is also circuitry like the control unit, but its job is to, remember the adder? Remember that full adder we made? You know, we did a one bit adder and then we put a bunch of those together and we called it a full adder. Um, you know, it's arithmetic, right? And by the way, basic arithmetic, I mean, uh, when you get into like fancy, like floating point stuff, most modern processors today have like a floating point coprocessor built in where that just dedicated processor where you just like throw the problem over the wall and then it just kicks you back the answer instead of trying to make the whole CPU grind that, you know, grind all that math. So it can run in parallel. Um, and then finally, there are registers. Now we already said before there was a memory address register, memory data register, and that registers were just specialized memory, right? Small specialized memory. Well, in this case, um, we're actually talking about um, we're talking about a specific set of registers that are like that belong to the CPU, like little scratch pads. If you think about it that way, you know what I mean. Like you start reading stuff out of memory, right? Into the M, you know, it goes into the MDR. Well, you got to start. You got to do stuff with that, right? So what's the, what are you going to do? You're going to take what's in the MDR and like just put it into a register, like register one, register five, register 17, depending on how many registers you got. Now I can start doing stuff with the data, like, you know what I mean? Reading stuff from my program or doing whatever I do. 
Um, so all of these local tiny little chunks of memory are registers, but these registers are registers that the CPU uses as scratch pads to do all their little calculations and hang on to stuff and right. Uh, in the LC3, there's eight of these general purpose registers, okay? Real modern systems are going to have a lot more than that, okay? And now we're going to break this down just a little more. Here comes control unit, okay? Which has two kind of key little chunks. So, yeah, we already, already mentioned it manages the flow of the whole thing. Fine. But it has two other special purpose registers. And again, right now, this is probably feeling... A little bit like alphabet soup, and it's washing over a little bit. Um, I would say, you know, come back to this, rewatch it, you know, look back, because um, we're going to go forward, and it'll just make a little more sense by repetition. And also in context, we're going to show you in the, in the diagram of the, of the LC3 uh, system, you know, where these are, okay? And that, if you're, if you're kind of a visual processor... You know what I mean? If you're like a visual, you know, a person that, that reasons visually, seeing that graphic is going to probably be a little bit helpful. Okay. Um, so there's a program counter. Now, by the way, the program counter, um, this is one of those funny little connections. The program counter holds the address of either the current instruction or the next instruction. Okay. So, remember the MAR and the MDR? Program counter is going to be the same size as one of those two. Which one? Lay it on me. That'd be the MAR? Yeah, it has to be the MAR because the MAR holds addresses and the program counter holds an address. Specifically, the address of either the current instruction or there's a point at which you have to increment it. You know what I mean? And when you increment it, now it holds the address of the next instruction. Before you increment it, it holds the address of the current instruction. But it has to be an address. Now, the instruction register holds the instruction being executed. Where'd that instruction come from? Answer, memory. So what's the size of that instruction register? What say you? Is that going to be the same size as the MDR? Yeah, it has to be. The, it has to be the same size as the MDR, which is the same size as the word size, right? Because the program counter says, "Yeah, that's the next instruction in our program," and then the the control unit goes, "Got it, coming right up. Fetch, decode, execute." I'm going to go fetch it. So it grabs at that address, goes out there, grabs an entire word at that location, pulls it out, and puts that in the instruction register. So the instruction register is kind of like where the MDR delivers its stuff. Into, you know, you, the MDR is part of memory, and it's got to go take that stuff and deliver it to the CPU. Where, is it, where does it deliver it to the CPU? The answer, it puts it in the CPU's instruction register. Program counter... You know, the memory address register is like, you got to give me the address of the next instruction you want me to get. That's coming from the program counter. Gets put into the MAR, grab the, you know, grab the contents at that location, take those contents, put those in the instruction register, increment the program counter so I'm looking at the next spot in memory. Boom, right? So that's, and this again, it'll be more clear. Right now it's probably like a little, uh, this is my impersonation of uncertainty. Um, but, okay, then we have the ALU. Uh, the only problem, with, I, I don't like saying ALU because it just, I feel like I tried to say ACLU and then I got it wrong. You know what I mean? Like I left the C out or something. But here's what we got. Basic math, add, subtract. Now, in, in modern computers, you know, those, it's going to include multiply, divide, you know what I mean? And it's going to be bitwise operators and it's going to have a pretty hefty set of stuff. LC3, super stripped down, okay? And, for example, in the LC3, uh, I think we can only add. 
We can do and or and not. Um, yeah. We can add. We can't even subtract in the LC3. Right? Turns out, though, we're good to go. We already know how to, how to take a number, negate it, and then add it to the other number. Okay. Um, yeah, this, this bullet here, the size of values that can be handled. That just means when I'm trying to add some numbers, it has, my, my answer has to fit in this space, right? In the space that I'm, you know, that I'm given. Modern computers, 32-bit, 64-bit words. Oh, and I can, the other thing that, that those registers, the specialized registers, they're directly accessible to the control unit and they're directly accessible to the ALU. So the control unit can say things like, oh, hey, ALU, take the contents of register one, add it to the contents of register three, put the results back into register one. And, and all of those are like just right there, tight, real close by. Okay. Now, and the reason that, and we'll talk more about this, but the reason is because it's super, super fast. Okay. Those registers are crazy fast. Very few clock cycles to get to jump around. We'll talk more about that. And then this part is where it gets really easy because this is the stuff that everybody's dealt with. Okay. Input, keyboard, mouse, mic, right? We call them peripheral devices because they are on the periphery. I say the periphery is certainly fresh this year, isn't it? You can also sound pretentious saying just about anything. Um, and then for output devices, monitor, classic, printer, speaker, you know, those are all output devices. Again, called peripheral devices. And then uh, there are devices we sometimes refer to as I.O. devices. This is a term, by the way, input-output. We say I.O., okay? Now, broadly speaking, a monitor is an I.O. device and a keyboard is an I.O. device. We sometimes use the term I.O. to refer to kind of broadly to monitors and keyboards and everything. There are some devices that, that directly do input and output like a hard drive, or like a network adapter, Bluetooth transceiver adapter connector, right? Stuff's coming in and it's going out. So that's another term where you will sometimes speak of, of specifically IO devices. And the terminology in my experience gets a little bit munged, but you know, mostly safe. Okay, now here is an example. This is from the book of the von Neumann architecture. Um, these are input devices over here on the left, output on the right. There's memory, there's the MAR and the MDR. There's the processing unit. And oh, control unit. I have noodled over this for two years now. That's a program counter. Is that trying to be an index finger? I think so. That legitimately, that legitimately looks like one. It doesn't look like a janky finger. finger. It's a totally <laughs> janky finger. Their cuticles check. Yeah, well, and you know, I haven't figured that part out yet. But there's the PC and there's the instruction. I guess unless it's trying to be like it's pointing. She doesn't look exactly like my finger. I don't know. I don't know. Um, now, the LC3, which is our little cozy little friend this semester, is an example of a von Neumann architecture. It is totally stripped down. And the other thing, too, um, that I want to just point out, I, I probably mentioned this somewhere at the beginning, but uh, there's a dilemma, a true and honest dilemma about how to do teaching of this kind of thing, architecture, computer organization, assembly language. The problem with, um, like if you go look, like I've debated, you know, do we do this thing with Raspberry Pi, for example? Um, the advantage of the LC3 is you can actually understand the whole thing. It's small, it's stripped down, you know, it's fully documented. The problem, the problem is it doesn't have like real, you know, things like a multiply 
or a subtract or, you know, there's just certain features that are kind of cool. The problem is for most of you, your head's kind of already explode as it is. So throwing, you know, a shift left operator on you, you know, or some other stuff, plus the documentation for the Raspberry Pi. No, not the Raspberry Pi even. The, just the ARM64 processor that's used in the Raspberry Pi. That bad boy is, uh, I know it's over a thousand pages. In my, I don't remember. I can, lo I can look it up, but if anybody's interested. But it's, it's Mondo. And so the struggle is, you know, do you... Hang on a second. I suddenly had to do this. Nope. Um, oh, here we go. Yeah, the architecture reference manual for the Raspberry Pi. There we go. Um, for the for the ARM version eight. Um, anyway, check it out right up there. Can you see that? Thirteen hundred and seventy six pages, and you know you drop into this thing, and blah 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 blah. Now, and I may be able to create a way to navigate through this, you know, using only a subset, and then actually doing that programming on the Raspberry Pi. Um, I am still very interested in trying to pull that off, but. The, the problem is it still has the potential, the potential to be like very encumbered. You know what I mean? A lot of different kinds of instructions. The first assembly language programming that I did professionally, well, the first time one I ever did, I think I mentioned it, was with, on a machine that had four byte words. And, you, and, and it was addressable at the half byte level. So I could address directly. Every two bits had its own unique address in the machine. And we used uh, Octal, which would, you know, instead of Hex. And so that was like my, literally my first ever experience with assembly language. And my first professional experience was the x86 assembler on an 8086 machine. Um, might have been, a, my, we might have been up to like 286s at that point, but it was an x86 assembly. And you had like weird, just weird things like the addressing scheme with a data segment and there was a 16-bit data segment and a 16-bit, uh, uh, there was a segment and an offset and you had to like blend those into a 20-bit address. And, you know, in real architectures, there's all this stupid crap you got to jump through, right? And with the LC3, it's like, nah, there it is. It's right there. It's got some struggles, but boom, you're right. So... To this point, I've kind of just stuck with the LC3, but I just want you to understand why I have not just pulled the trigger and just said, oh, everything's, you know, but I really would like to do something where if anybody wanted to do the Raspberry Pi, they could because they were ready for that professional, you know, more professional experience, um, you know, if they were ready for it. Most students in this class, based on preparation to this point, aren't ready for that. And so I'm kind of optimizing to that, so... Again, if you're itching to get going, you know, apologies. And you can still go get yourself a Raspberry Pi and knock yourself out. Okay, <clears throat> here's the LC3. This is the whole thing. I'd like to apologize for the pink. I did not do that. That came from the book, from the publisher. Um, what I'm going to do right now, we're going to, yeah, we're going to go. So I'm going to go till 2.30. That's 15 minutes overtime. And then again, if you got to cut out to go to class or, you know, work schedule, whatever, pause, come, you know, come back to finish that last part. Okay. <clears throat> so what you've got is there on the left here is the control unit. Um, hang on. I got glare on my external monitor. There we go. Uh, you got the control unit over here on the left and you got the processing unit over here on the right, the way the LC3 is set up. The processing unit includes the registers, which are over here, and the ALU. And the control unit includes the program counter right there, the instruction register right here, 
and that state machine. That, that whole state machine is right here because it takes that instruction register and that drives the state machine. State machine causes everything else to pop and do what it does. This is memory down here off the bus over here with the MDR and the MAR. And then there's input output, which we'll talk about in much greater detail way later, uh, you know, in a few weeks. But, um, but what's interesting about this is at first glance, I know your eyes kind of fuzz. And it's like a lot of lines, a lot of boxes, and you kind of like, because there's also stuff you don't necessarily know what it is. All that's okay. But what's really amazing to me is that this is it. <clears throat> this is the whole thing. There's no, there's no commercially available, you know, processor that's remotely as simple as this, you know. So, so yeah, the just the the reg file is different from the memory. That's right. That reg file. One way to look at that reg file is see over here in the memory, right? There's like. Location zero, location one, location two, location three, right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> All the way to, in the case of the LC3, um, there are, it's, uh, it's two bytes at every location. So it's 16-bit addressable, two-byte words or 16-bit words. And, uh, and the, MD, the MAR is 16 bits. Everything's 16 bits. So the MAR is 16 bits, which means you've got two to the 16th locations, which means you've got approximately 64K. Well, you have exactly 64K of memory locations, two at each one. So there's 64K of memory in the LC3. Okay. This here is basically just another memory. It's not okay. a separate memory. And in fact, it's like addressable. Zero, one, two, three. Only those zeros we refer to as register zero, register one, register two, register three. For memory addresses, would we refer to the address of zero, 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 zero as location zero or location one? Um, I would call that location zero. Okay. Yeah. And so the register, the reg file is like a cache kind of a scratch pad to work with while it works with the ALU and then it returns it and stores it in somewhat more permanent memory. Yep. Yep. Okay. If it needs to, right? To the extent it needs to save stuff out to memory. Sure. Sure. <clears throat> what you can already begin to see is that the, the memory and the peripherals <clears throat> are out on the bus and all the processes and hoops you have to go through to get stuff out there takes clock cycles. That's slow. Mm -hmm. The registers, very few clock cycles. Okay. You set it up, you like boink, drop straight in. Here, take the thing, put it on the bus, put that in the MAR, MAR goes in, select all the things we did with that memory thing, pull mm -hmm. it out, MDR, back on the bus. You know what I mean? There's all those steps. Um, whereas this register file, it's all just like, boom, right there. Okay. Um, and when we talk about that, I, I wanted to say one thing. I think of the register, and sometimes, by the way, in modern processes, there's cache memory, which is like, it's, it's like memory like this down here, like the RAM. But it's a small set of really, really fast memory that lives with the CPU. It's not the registers, you know. So the registers are kind of like, I don't know. Uh, to me, the registers are like right in your pocket. Like, oh, yeah, you got that right here. You know, that to me is what the registers are. The, the cache memory is like, oh, yeah, it's right here in my backpack. You know what I mean? It's really close to my body or it's in my wallet or it's in my purse. You know what I mean? So the um, cache is still the cache is slightly removed when compared to the reg file. And the memory is slightly more removed than the reg file and the cache. That's right. That's and right. storage is more removed than memory. Exactly right. And it moves like at least an order of magnitude difference, right? So <clears throat> I can go like, here's my pocket. That's like a register. And then here's in my backpack. You know, that's, that's more like the cache memory. Main memory is like if I'm in the building, it's like my office. Got to go upstairs, go down to the CS department, down to my office. 
that's like going to main memory. Okay? A hard drive? That's like driving home. You know, I live in Lehigh. Like dry, you know, getting on, right? Getting out of UVU, jump in my car, drive to, to Lehigh, get it, come on back. That's like going out to main memory. Sorry, sorry, sorry. That's what like going out to a hard drive. Now, what about the internet? Okay, get on an airplane, fly to France. Okay. That's this sort of different. That's why the closer you are, the fewer delays there are, the fewer latencies there are. And there's a hierarchy, right? The farther away you are, the cheaper it is. The closer it is to you, the more expensive it is. You don't build an entire world out of cache memory because it's crazy expensive. But it's super fast and right there handy. So, <clears throat> okay. So, that's memory. We already, I already did this. That's memory. So, a few more details. We're going to walk through... <clears throat> We're going to walk through each of these chunks right now, okay, with a few more details. Here comes memory. The MAR is 16 bits, and that this little notation right here with the slash and then 16, that says that there are 16 lines, 16 wires coming down. Is that it's just shorthand, okay? So it looks like one line, but it's actually 16 bits wide. Um, so the MAR has 16 bits. Uh, the MDR is also 16 bits. And there's a 16-bit addressable memory. Every location memory is 16 bits, a.k.a. two bytes. I'm going to keep going if you don't stop me, okay? And again, you can come back and revisit this. And remember that that the that the PowerPoint slides are on Canvas, so you can if you ever want to just pull down just my slides, you know you don't want to listen to me. You know, see the slides, walk through the slides for study and whatever. They're right there. Okay, I/O. Here we go, and we are not going to break. We're not going to bog down on this yet. We'll come to we'll come to I/O later. There's key. There's a data a keyboard data register and a keyboard status register, which is what those are. Right here, input and output. There's a monitor, which is uh, called, the D stands for like display data register and display status register. We'll get that in chapter eight. Uh, the processing unit. We've talked about this already a little bit. We got the ALU, we got the registers, there are eight of them. <clears throat> all the math in, all the, all the addition in this ALU is two's complement. Okay? Well, uh, when we are dealing with signed numbers, it's all two's complement. How about that? When we're doing mathy math math, two's complement. When we're incrementing the program counter, there's no negative number there. You know what I mean? When we're dealing with the instruction register, no negative number there. We have a bitwise and and a bitwise not and an addition. That's it. We don't even have or. No, is that true? Yeah, straight up, I don't think we have an or. It ain't much, my friends. That's all we got. We're going to give you like a, a knife, a little fire starter kit, you know what I mean? And a compass and a bottle of, you know, Diet Coke and then drop you off in the wilderness. That's all you got. Hope to see you back at camp. Um, the control unit. <clears throat> we mentioned the finite. I already mentioned these. Finite state machine, instruction register, program counter. Boom. Put it all together. You know what? I'm trying to figure out. Oh, no, no, we're not done. We're not done. No fear, my friends. We have more slides to go here. I was thinking, okay, this because this felt like suddenly really climactic. Like there should be some mood music, you know. Um, okay. Cool. We're going to keep coming back to this picture. So again, if it's a little bit weird, <coughs> remember that everything we're doing in this class is fluency. It's all about fluency. So you've got to spend, you got to spend time with it. You can't cram it 
or gloss over it and then expect to be okay. It, it is not going to happen. Okay. All right. <clears throat> Questions at this point? Are we good? I'm going to rock and roll. Okay. What we're going to talk about now, while we're talking about um, this von Neumann architecture, which I already said, right, is fetch, decode, execute. We're going to break that down. We're going to talk, talk about the fetch, decode, execute cycle, and we are going to break it down in gory detail. This is going to lead us to the idea. Remember I said that, that in memory was instructions and data. Instructions are just 16-bit values. And that 16-bit value tells the, the control unit what to do. That's it, really. That's the whole thing. And, and, and what to do it with. Like it'll, all, that, all the programs you know, that you ever have ever run on a, on a computer or a smartphone, laptop, whatever, tablet, has com been comprised of a bunch of words in memory <clears throat> holding instructions which are fetched by the control unit, decoded, executed, and then grab the next one. Literally, that's all the programs that you've ever seen run. It's what they're doing. Which is crazy that that's still the thing almost 100 years later. Okay. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much it. Now, here we go. The instruction. It is the basic unit of computer processing. This is the machine instruction, okay? This is machine language. When someone talks about machine language, this is what they're talking about, okay? In the case of the LC3, we're talking about a bunch of, you know, 16-bit values put into memory and then the program counter is pointed to the first one. And then we say, go. That's it. That's programming. That is programming in machine language. You know you want this. No, you do. Okay? This instruction, and remember, remember social contract? Remember social contract? Right? How do I tell if something's an instruction or data? You don't. You can't, not, by looking at it, no, you can't tell at all. So, you know, the only way I can tell that something is an instruction, any guesses? I'll wait like three seconds. I don't, have, I don't want to burn too much time. How you can tell it's ultimately at the end of the day, how you can tell that something is an instruction. Okay, actually, the truth is you can't. But I can tell you how I can tell that the computer thinks it's an instruction. And the answer is the program counter points at it once. At some, at some time, the program counter points at it. That tells me that the computer thinks it's an instruction. But it turns out I can manipulate the program counter by jumping and branching and doing things, is it possible for me to change the program counter so that it points me into rando spot in memory where there's actually data? Any guesses? You know what the macabre answer to that question is, right? Anybody? Nothing stops me. Nothing stops me. Right? If you, if you change the program counter to point anywhere, the control unit is just going to go, ah, program counter knows where we're going next. Fetch it, grab it, pull it out. What is it? It's the letter, it's the letter capital Z. <laughs> you know what I mean? Puts it in the instruction register and tries to execute it. Social contract doesn't know that it's a capital Z, you know, or 
some number representing your bank account, something. Doesn't know. Tries to execute it. Okay. Um, so these, these are the two basic chunks of an instruction. Okay. The first one we call the opcode. That is a standard term. Okay. In the industry. Always call that an opcode. That, um, so the answer, so Tyler asked, if, if with the 16-bit architecture in the LC3, can we have 32-bit integers in any way? Now, if you meant, can we have 32-bit integers anyway, it's one question, and in any way, and in any way, yes, absolutely. Um, but you would have to build your own routines to sort of like cobble these things together and handle the logic because the native world of the LC3 is 16-bit, you know? Like you'd have to store your, these integers in like two locations in memory. The high, high order word and the low order word, you know? And then you'd have to pull those out. If you wanted to do arithmetic, you'd have to pull two locations in memory, four bytes each. Then, you know, you'd have to, you'd just have to do the logic to, to knit it all together. But, but could you do it yourself? Yes. Does the LC3 do it natively? No. Okay. Um, so the opcode is what the... Comp a great question, by the way, Tyler. The, the opcode is what this instruction is trying to do. And every opcode in the LC3 is 4 bits. In other architectures, it's... Oh, pretty much always more than that because 16-bit instructions are also, you know, for modern architectures, they're going to typically be bigger than that, okay? Um, sorry, I'm scouting uh, Jigs. I like Jigsaw Puzzles. That one was like uh, hooking me a little bit. Um, okay. Opcode's 4 bits in the LC3. The other chunk we call operands. Now, this is the important thing. These um, 12 bits, there are 12 bits here in the operands, right? They go from 0 to 11. And there are 4 bits uh, in the opcode. Um, why, why do we start numbering from right to left? Why, why do the numbers go backwards here, right? I mean, is this like, you know, we read in Arabic or Hebrew? What are we doing here? Anybody want to guess? Or, you know, if you know or have an idea. That does introduce latency. Should I just go? I may, I may need to just to keep the, keep the speed going. Uh, it's because we, you know, it's just like when we talked about the zeroth bit, right? We always talked about that one's two to the one or two to the zero, two to the one, two to the two, two to the three. We just get used to looking at, at bytes as being low order bit to the right, high order bit to the left, and we do kind of, you know, number them that way. Anyway, that's the convention. So depending upon the opcode, the operand fields are gonna be different. Fields are going to be different, okay? I, I hope that kind of makes sense. We're gonna break this down and it's gonna make some sense to you before we're done. How are we doing on time? 229, okay, actually, so let's pause right here. So 229, this is 15 minutes over. I think that we should be able to finish this module Thursday, maybe, uh, and then next Tuesday at the latest. We're just going to kind of try to keep it moving, okay? But we'll be okay. back on this one. It's slide 38, and we're just getting into these instructions, so... Um, okay, so, and I'm going to go ahead and just like stop streaming, uh, to YouTube, but I'll have, you know, I'm stick. I got a few minutes if anybody has, you know, direct questions or whatever that they want to, that they want to hit me with. All right. Here's hoping.